Welcome to Buddha and the Slut. I'm your host, Brooke Burgess. You might know me from game work, motion comics, web stuff, the miracle of Facebook, the Shadowland saga. If not, then visit brookburgess.com or stalk me on Google like a normal person. Jesus, the entitlement today. So what's this weekly podcast going to be about? Well, you can expect some painfully true tales, funny, freaky, fucked up, and mostly at my expense of sex, drugs, geekish delights, and the digital nomad life, which is working out of a backpack in some godforsaken corner of the globe with decent Wi-Fi, sketchy law enforcement, and nude beaches. Future episodes promise to have a schwack of special guests and audio exclusives, thanks to the power of blackmail, and thank God for drunken texts that I keep. And maybe, just maybe, when the mood is right, we will veer into the realm of the mystical, share some very real and very revealing experiences, divine and profane, hence the title of the podcast, of things both wonderful and strange. Why, yes, that is a Twin Peaks reference, which, if you know your shit from your Shinola, ain't the worst place for this story and the very first podcast to begin. I call this one Peaks and Geeks. I never traveled as a kid. I was afraid to miss school and ruin a perfect attendance record. No joke. The only trip I had was a last minute club all inclusive to Aruba, the very first Christmas home from university. I was 18 and fought with my folks the entire time. Vegas of the Caribbean and no blackjack per diem? That's what you get, mom. In the end, I think they felt guilty enough for kicking me out of the hotel room and forcing me to sleep on the beach for a night, for my first time in a foreign country, no less, that they bought me a limited edition swatch at Duty Free, the one with the black strap and the mirrored face. Hey, when you're the only child and still not the favorite, such things are the spoils of war. Back then, and now too if I'm being honest, the thought of traveling meant the chance to lose myself, like I did in daydreams or every night when I slept. Take every bad thing in my head and heart and guts and punch a hole in the sun, make it go supernova, explode with it. And imagine all those little pieces flying out into the void far enough and fast enough for long enough that eventually they'd make it somewhere better. Maybe they'd go so far that they'd come back around the other side of the universe full circle and snap right back into place. Like the journey would somehow help me to find myself again, but better. New and improved. I know, this is the kind of shit that passed for deep thoughts in my teens. I hadn't touched drugs yet, and probably was the Iron Maiden, that's what I blame. But I lived in Sutton, Ontario. Nobody went anywhere. How's it going, eh? Want to go to the mansion house, get hammered, and do it in the back of the station wagon? Everybody I knew, they just drank and fucked and... I guess waited to die. I wasn't so big on the drinking or the dying at the time. Now asterisks, things change, and my stances on drinking and dying have matured like fine wine. But those are tales for another day. Now fucking, that was a different manner altogether. But I was way too much of a loser to get laid. We're talking the heart of hockey town, son. Smart, skinny kids who skipped grades, cried easy, and had hard-ons for comic books and Dungeons and & Dragons and high school musicals. When you're a jet, you're a jet all the way, but don't sing it out loud or they'll make you go gay. Hey! Those kind of kids were in for forced blowjobs at best, and not the receiving kind. Ain't nostalgia grand. So then, how the fuck, nearly 30 years later, am I telling you all this from southern Greece in the oldest medieval town in Europe, recording it for you at a kitchen table in the ancient city of Rhodes with a monastery from the 1300s next door and foundations from a 7th century BC bathhouse down the block? That's a far cry from that hilariously sad perfect attendance kid whose folks convinced him that the twin horrors of locked up abroad and the white slave trade were waiting on every corner without a maple leaf on it, eh? I'm going to freestyle on this a bit now and try to loop back to that whole Twin Peaks reference thing I did at the start. See what I did there? I'm, I'm a clever boy. 
After finishing my degree at university in Windsor, Ontario, which was the furthest west I'd been to that point, had a lead count in the water that could give a moose Alzheimer's, and also had the highest number of strip joints per capita, future podcast note, it looked like I was headed for the big smoke, Toronto, which is basically New York's lame cousin who's still in the closet, buys organic, and says he knows Drake. Toronto, where I'd try my hand at the advertising thing. Do a few years of copywriting, then some creative direction, work 80 hours a week, learn the secret douchebag handshake, and then strike gold with an account like Nintendo or the Blue Jays or Molson fucking Canadian Christ buttered popcorn. Can any of you who know me picture that? There's gotta be some parallel universe where I am knee deep in dead hookers wearing strap-ons and signing a suicide note before taking a header out the penthouse window like some low rent Don Draper from Nova Scotia. Give her buddy. But I couldn't. I just couldn't do it. The thought of that kind of life made me sick, literally sick, like spasms and hives and vomiting with anxiety. What an asshole, right? Who was I to think that maybe, just maybe, there was more to life than dreaming of golf vacations in a future where fluorescent lights would actually boost vitamin D levels instead of giving you cancer? I was having different dreams now. Dreams of evergreen trees and mountains and mist. Of secret doors in the dark, dark woods that opened like drapes and swallowed you whole, spitting you out on the zigzag floor of another world. A scary, backwards-talking world with dwarves and giants and screaming dead girls and greasy-haired demons. Wow, Bob, wow. I got idea, man. You take me for a walk. Under the sycamore trees. Twin Peaks, motherfucker. See, I told you I was going to bring that boat around. TV had always been this vital presence for me. Monolithic, friends for life, never going to give you up, never going to let you down. And I can make that reference because the song came out when I was 17, bitch. And I first heard it on TV. At that point, my personality had been moosed and gelled into place more by Jack Tripper on Three's Company and Hawkeye Pierce on M.A.S.H. than by anyone or anything flesh and blood. Hockey Town, Ontario, remember? Can you blame me? I spent my evenings and weekends hiding in the basement and either playing video games and masturbating, reading comics and masturbating, or watching reruns for the hundredth time and speed jerking through the commercials. A questionable march to manhood, you say? Well, maybe... But then everything changed when Agent Cooper crossed the state line for the Laura Palmer case. This was a new kind of cool, and a cooler kind of weird. A gentle but fearless, straight-laced but geeky, sharp-dressed super Buddha. Before I had the first inkling of what that even meant. A shamanic hero who found the courage to confront his shadow self in the finale only to be destroyed by it. Smashed into pieces like his bathroom mirror, lost on the edges of now and forever, cut to credits, cliffhanger, and... Yeah, those were spoilers. I wanted that. I wanted a life like that, in a place like that. I wanted to burst into a thousand pieces and have all the king's horses and all the king's men put me back together again there. So I had to find it, right? Answer the soul's call. Twin Peaks wasn't real, you say. That, that didn't mean shit to me. Clearly, I was willing to settle for the reasonable Canadian facsimile, and Vancouver was close enough for me. Doppelganger. I read a story way back in the PIT, pre-internet times, that you could be in the middle of Van City, take a bus across the downtown bridges, and be on the local mountains in 30 minutes or less. Mountains. Trees. Fog on the waterfront. Fucking right. The X-Files shot there too, and I heard that local actors got parts on the show all the time. And I could act. It was my minor in university, and don't forget those high school musicals, right? I could audition with Vancouver-themed versions. To dream the impossible dream, to smoke the unsmokable weed. So I convinced my girlfriend at the time to flip Toronto the fat finger and move out west. Blow up our lives and see what happens when our bright-eyed Hicktown pieces came back together on the shores of the Pacific. Long story short-ish, I lived in Vancouver for 20 years, grew out my hair like a Pearl Jam reject, and stomped around in flannel and Doc Martens. 
got an agent and did some shitty commercials. I remember seeing one of Nirvana's last concerts at the PE, and this was just weeks before Courtney eased a double barreled dick into Kurt's smacked up song hole and robbed us of a genius, you cunt. I remember smoking my first truly epic hit of BC Chronic at that show and being dragged outside during the encore after collapsing face first in a puddle of piss. I remember telling the cute paramedic that I was a respectable member of society over and over again. I'm high and my nose is gushing blood and I smell like a golden shower and still I'm clinging to illusions of social status. A few weeks later, the uni girlfriend and I broke up. We had seen a weird movie and were fighting that somehow triggered a crazy shared vision. We were sober, I swear. But that vision would forever change the course of our lives. Sadly, not together. Won't go into it here. Future podcast note number two. But I suggest filing it away for now. Some things are worth the investment. So, yeah. Life-changing vision, amicable breakup, bikers and cocaine for her, nervous breakdown in Street Fighter 2 for me, super turbo, natch. It was about a year of wake and baking and late night nacho runs at 7-Eleven and welfare checks. Sometimes I'd lie awake at night in that fucking basement apartment coming down from hits of milk chocolate and Lynn Valley Bud when I'd hear it, the voice in my head. You want it to be blown to bits, buddy. You asked for this. That was a long and shameful year, but I had to believe the storm would pass. It finally did when an acting associate, fellow gaming enthusiast, and local football hero, all the same person who wouldn't dare tarnish his reputation by working with a loser, unless that was his plan, so he could keep all the chicks to himself. Fucker. Well, whatever, this dude asked if I wanted to help him open a video game store. (laughs) Yeah, I did. And do you know why? Because I loved games. The office had you know, cable TV, and I had this fantasy that I was actually Randall from Kevin Smith's Clerks. I don't appreciate your ruse, ma'am. You're not allowed to rent here anymore. Man, those were some good times. Soon I had teen disciples skipping school to hear me rant. They brought me smokes and meatball subs. This was before the Jared is a pedophile thing. And baggies of magic mushrooms as tokens of respect. My mind was opening. My confidence was growing. I wrote a fucked up fringe festival play about how I lost my virginity, got scammed for abortion money, and then sold my soul to the devil in an Earl's restaurant bathroom a decade later to get revenge, based on a true story. This got me some press, this got me laid, and this got me a visit from this grateful dead looking son of a bitch with an offer I couldn't refuse. I, uh, I work for a little company with two vowels in the name, you might have heard of it. E and... A. E. A. Sports. For some reason, he thought I could help him look good. His words, not mine. I hadn't even sent an email before, let alone work for a billion dollar interactive media company. Still, he persisted. You're, uh, you're smarter than 99% of the people working for me, and you wouldn't want the jobs of the other 1%. Here's the silver platter. All you gotta do is put your balls on it. So, now I'm a working man. I'm going places. But how does that get us closer to this fine plate of local feta cheese and olives sitting right here on this kitchen table? Well, now I had money. And said money got me hooked on the worst drug of all for me, girlfriend heroin. You know what I'm talking about. Get archaeological and start digging through all the layers of your dating dirt until you find that one girl, or guy, or sheep, I don't judge, who you'd cut your wrists for just to smell the bathroom after they were done with it. Oh yeah. And there was no way in hell I was gonna impress my raven-haired goddess with the upturned nose and the cracked jade eyes and the swollen pink holes I dreamt of being buried in when I died. I wouldn't win this one with angsty poetry or Wonder Bread French toast in bed or committing the Kama Sutra to memory. This girl wrote verse like Ani DeFranco could bake beautiful things from scratch and had a string of basketball and local rapper exes of the highly pigmented persuasion. Huh? Smell what I'm cooking? Nothing I had was going to be enough. Unless it was something new. Blow her world to pieces and she'd see me with new eyes on the other side. The travel dreams 
had returned. I knew what needed to happen now. I pulled overtime at work, I cashed my stocks, I saved all my pennies instead of wasting them on porn. Hey, rentals were two bucks a piece at Tom's video and five dollars for three. The next spring, I surprised her with a three week trip to the South Pacific. Fiji, bitch. And here's where the dominoes really start to fall. The time in that strange jungle world struck me like lightning, caved my head in like a sledgehammer. I didn't recognize myself. We got back and I fled that cubicle barnyard at EA six months later. Two months after that, well, I kicked the girlfriend heroin too. Bought some gear and a backpack and let my methadone be a tour of New Zealand, Australia and more of Polynesia. I followed the Lord of the Rings shoots and hiked through semi-active volcanoes. I read tarot cards for strangers and smoked hash with Harry Krishnas for Y2K. I drank kava with village chiefs and spearfished in the coral reefs off Fenwalevu. And I met girls of every English-speaking stripe. Yanks and Brits and Kiwis and Aussies and South Africans, who all seemed more than happy to use my chin as a chair in a scientific bid to map the G-spot with my tongue and or fist. That trip inspired me to create my magnum opus Broken Saints, the freaky-ass motion comic series you might have heard of. Three years of that ended up taking me to conferences in Europe and across the U.S. Soon enough, I had an agent in L.A. and a manager. For three more years, they pushed me to hustle, but no matter how hard I tried, it, it just didn't feel right. It wasn't me. I, I still remember the moment in that guy's office in Beverly Hills, my agent, when advisors for me were yammering on about the next big thing with every Hollywood cliche in the book. Uh, yeah, we, we love you, baby. You're, you're great. You're going to be the next Tim Burton. I remember quipping, what, you want me to be a glorified art director? <laughs> they laughed through clenched teeth, and that's when the cold sweats hit. I thought I was going to collapse in my chair. M my vision, it got dark around the edges, it narrowed, and whatever bullshit they were saying started to sound like a pair of Charlie Brown's teachers. Wah, 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 wah. Everything receded away, except there was another voice that came in, and it sounded like it was whispering from my shoulder. Why do you want to make illusions when the real world is still calling to you. Fuck me. That moment, that moment changed everything. LA back to Vancouver, Vancouver to London, parted ways with a long distance lover there and hopped on a train to Southern France. Hiked for five weeks and 900 kilometers on the legendary Way of St. James, the Santiago de Compostela, breaking Hungarian hearts and following ancient graffiti the entire way. Back to Vancouver, I got a grant, wrote a screenplay, sold all my shit, and accepted the invitation of another girl to move east to the Paris of the Prairies, which is Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, FYI, where I'm guessing the only things Parisian about it were the river running through downtown and the one in four chlamydia rate. And Saskatoon begat extreme cold, which begat alcoholism and a pitch black depression. This wasn't an explosion anymore. This wasn't turning into pieces that would reach out and become something better. This was a collapse. I considered finding one more lover. This wouldn't be hard. It was Saskatoon after all. Two weeks prior, some drunken farm girl stumbled over to me at the local rock and roll joint and slurred in my ear, I've got two words for you. Panty soup. Now, I've got nothing against home cooking, especially a good soup, but I didn't take her home that night because I'm not usually into blondes and I didn't have any penicillin handy. But when things got darker, I wasn't so worried anymore about health or hair color. Besides, she seemed like the type to bring her own meth and think of pile driver anal as foreplay. I just wanted to shoot Jaeger and chain smoke and bang till I was stone cold. Just like kids from my hometown. Drink, fuck, and die, remember? just like them. Then I could march naked out the front door in minus 30 Celsius, little cumsicles dripping from my tired little dick, and lay down in the snowbank somewhere. I remember laughing at the thought of the person finding me the next day, trying to figure out why the fuck this fat hairy chick had a death wish. <laughs> because with my junk and this kind of cold, that's as good as a sex change, son. But I put it off. 
I put it off because I still had one more addiction that had to be dealt with. TV. Remember? Specifically, Lost. I was addicted to Lost. I'm sorry. Now, don't stop listening yet. Get your finger off the X or the stop button or the pause. I swear to you, this is going somewhere. I know and you know that Lost was and is no Twin Peaks. But part of me wanted it to be because it had that ever-present air of mystery. It had some of that slow, ratcheting dread, some flickers of absurd, cool smoke monster, am I right? And it had Desmond. I love you, Penny. Wait for me. You are my constant. That's the worst Scottish ever, but eat a dick. Um, But Lost also had these little spooky gossamer strings of something, dare I say it, spiritual, right? This was a show that seemed to be about karma, characters remembering their past lives and using that pain and knowledge to fix their lives in the present and help those who are trapped with them. They had all been going somewhere, Oceanic Flight 815, and then were lost in that plane crash. And in that moment of explosive change, they arrived somewhere new. Maybe it was somewhere better, if they were brave enough to let go of everything that had come before. That was the message of the show, the willingness to be destroyed, because maybe that's the only way they could find themselves again. So, no overdoses or freezing to death in a snowbank just yet, because I had to watch the finale. I wouldn't do anything rash until then, just two more hours with Jack, probably crying, Kate, we have to go back. And at some point, I'd make a decision, que sera sera. So I waited. I didn't have cable, but I found a streaming link about 20 minutes after the show aired. I turned out all the lights, drank some scotch, and I watched it. There was a lot of bullshit. A lot. But then something happened. Something in those last few minutes of the shiny purgatory they were in in the multi-denominational church of what's happening now. Spoilers. When all the souls from the island were reunited and they remembered and they hugged and they kissed and they smiled and they cried and they all walked into the light together as one. I cried like a fucking baby. This seems to be a theme for this show, but I cried till I was breathless. I could not stop it. It didn't make any sense. This wasn't the show doing this to me. I had watched a lifetime of TV. It had taught me and changed me and soothed me and babysat me, but it couldn't kick the shit out of me like this for five days straight. No. This was more. This was a vision. I was being shown something. Reminded of something I had almost forgotten. The cycle of destruction and reintegration. Settling and travel. Sameness and change death and birth, twin peaks, and fucking lost. Ten years earlier, during that nervous breakdown, I took it upon myself to figure out what the fuck was happening to me. This was before the internet was a part of my life, before Facebook and Reddit and searching DP GIFs on Tumblr. This was my score at the library. Lifetimes of knowledge gleaned from the great spiritual traditions of the world. Now, I understood most of the stories, but I guess I never saw them as useful. Until that moment, weeping in my underwear in an empty bathtub in Saskatoon. This was old shit. My own Hindu creation myth happening again and again. Of Brahman, the perfect consciousness shining in the empty, endless void. I have everything, but I do not change. Without change, I cannot improve. The only way to reach perfection is to lose myself completely and then find it again in the pieces. Boom. Consciousness lost. Shattered like Agent Cooper's soul in the Black Lodge at the end of Twin Peaks. That boom is the Big Bang. Then the quantum foam and the super strings, micro and multiverses, galaxies of plasma, gas and dust, stars, planets, atmospheres, bacteria, amoebas, oceans and skies and land filling with life upon life upon life until 
enough of those pieces come together to form something new, something alive enough, awake enough, aware enough, something that remembers, remembers what it was, what it is, and maybe what it is destined to be. And in remembering, it knows that its duty is to remind others, lifetime after lifetime, collapsing into darkness, exploding into life, losing self, and then getting it all back better than before, wiser, more. So I sold the last of my stuff, plotted a course overseas, went back and forth and back again, again and again for years, because that's how it works, years or lifetimes, so many places, so many experiences, so many insane and brilliant and terrifying and beautiful moments, so many things to share from the journey with you and with myself. That's the point, right? At the end of all things, they're pretty much the same. This has been episode one of Buddha and the Slut. I hope you'll subscribe to the show on iTunes or whatever service floats your podcast boat. Please spread the gospel to like-minded listeners. Stop by my site at brookburgess.com. Add me on Twitter at Broken Saint or send me chocolate and cash. Tune in next week for music and fun. And if you're not careful, you might learn something before we're done. Hey, 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 don't give Rudy the pudding pop. Buddha and the Slut has been brought to you today from the heart of southern Greece by feta cheese. Feta cheese. That smell you feared back then because it meant someone's genitals just ain't right. Now it's the only thing that makes a salad complete. Can't stop feta man. Can't stop fate. Can't stop fate.